Good afternoon and welcome everybody to our session Set Standards and Close Cycles. So before we get into the standard session um, today, um, which we're going to have in English as shown in the program, I just wanted to tell you that if you have any questions, you can post the questions in German and we're going to discuss this then in the panel or with you um, and reply back in English. So to, just to keep that um, uh, easier for the ones uh, who prefer to speak German. Now, uh, in order to get started today, we're going to hear two presentations. One is about DIN, the standardization system of DIN and the standards we publish, and the other is about uh, C2C, the Product Innovation Institute. So this is going to take us the first 20 minutes, then we're going to have a very exciting panel discussion with voices out of the industry, and then we're going to discuss that with you. And I'm hoping um, you have some questions, um, which we are then happy to answer. So in order to get started, and not to waste too much time for the introduction, um, Emily, uh, my colleague at DIN and an innovation manager at DIN, is going to start with the first presentation for today. Thank you very much. We all know Fridays for Future. We all know this call, Save Our Planet. We all know this call refers to politics. We all have seen Greta Thunberg and all the others talk to politics. And that's a fantastic work they are doing. And this is really great. And I wish them all the best. But politics is only one set of rules that has impact on our everyday life. There's another, another set of rules which almost nobody really knows, or at least nobody really knows how it works. And this is the technical rules. They seem to be invisible, and nobody really knows how they are actually developed. And that's really bad, because technical rules are developed by you guys, just you don't know. So one place where you can actually develop them is DIN for Germany, the German Institute for Standardization. The important thing is we are a neutral platform. We are not the stakeholders. We are not acting. We are not actually writing the content. We are organizing that people like you can sit together around the table and create the standards. And it's crucial that you know about it, because if you don't, you won't come to us. And maybe there are some rules where you think, well, this is really bullshit. What's Dean doing? Well, we don't know. We are not the research doing. We are not building it. We are not working it out. We are organizing the whole thing. So if you don't come to us and tell us if something needs to be changed, then nobody will. And that's why we are here today to tell you that you are invited you can get in contact with us. And in order to understand how deep the impact of standardization is, you need to look at the founding date. It's founded 1917. OK, nowadays everybody knows what 1917 means because there's this movie right now. But this is the middle of the First World War. Oh, it doesn't go. I'm sorry. It's supposed to be this slide right here. I don't know why it doesn't change. You're copying slides right now. Yeah. So you were supposed to see this one and now this one. <laughs> so this is our building. This is the future building because it's going to be remodeled right now. Um, if you think of 1917, you know, this is First World War, so people would have different problems than creating an institute for standards. But actually, only in those times when nothing really works out, it's really crucial that things on a basic level work together. And that's how even the German industry found that um, they need to talk to each other. Because, you know, sometimes people think there's nothing as German as standards, but it's only valid when you think of applying the standard, but standardization is the way before it, the way of creating them, the way of 
talking with each other, getting to know each other, finding compromises. And well, we needed this crunch to actually do it. So when you think of standards, you may think there is like what I know from my own company, like a company standard that is just valid for the small bunch of people around us. And then there's of course the big standard like Norman. They really take their time and it's really a long story until they work and maybe you know someone who has been working with us and this person said, well, it took 10 years to get it working. Well, this is just too long. The world's gonna be down by then. We have another thing we can offer you, it's specification. This is the sort of fast track. That's all I want to say about that one right now. If you have more questions, of course, I will tell you everything I know about that, that this is going to take a little more than five minutes. Now, Benjamin, your turn. Yes, um, no, yes, no, it's up to me to give you an overview about what we got. On, on standards. And one standard we just have published in January 2020 is um, the standard on environmental management systems, guidelines for incorporating circularity aspects into the design and the development, which is pretty important for a company um, to uh, make sure that this is going to be included in a systematic manner. And by complying with the standard, um, you can actually make sure that this is uh, this has been done in your company. Um, the standard is out as a draft. It can be reviewed and com uh, commented um, by the end of March. I'm happy to receive uh, comments from you, so just look into it and yeah, tell us about the standard. Then there's another standard project. <clears throat> this is another international big standardization project, which is ongoing. It's just been sh started. It's about the design, design of circularity, pretty much. And um, if the standard comes out, you can actually uh, have a standard which takes into consideration repair, reuse, upgrade, refurbishment, remanufacture, and the number of materials that are going to be used in your product that they are narrowed down to the absolute minimum. Also, um, little people uh, know about these standards, but there are standards in place for recycled plastics on European level. Um, my colleagues at Dean from the Plastics Committee are currently checking up on these standards and we're trying to improve them. This is also something which is keeping us busy and uh, we think that is um, very important um, to further look into that. Packaging. Uh, we heard this morning a lot about packaging. Packaging um, is very, very handy and you need it for protection purposes, etc. So we need packaging. But once uh, we have used it, we want it to disappear. That's not going to happen. So we have to look into other ways, what, what do we do with that? And that's why we have a standard on reuse and organic recycling um, for packaging. There are two standards issued on that. Um, another pretty important standard standardization project, this is one of the fast moving um, standardization projects, is that um, open source hardware project. So what the community, the open source community realized is that a lot of hardware projects, they start as an open source project, but they end up like being a mixture, not being a 100% open source hardware project. So what I wanted to do is making sure that whoever wants to get into open source hardware, that they're complying with a standard which lays down the requirements they have to fulfill for the documentation. So that actually, if you sell a piece of um, equipment which is open source hardware that you have the possibility to repair it yourself, to upgrade it, you know, and that you're not depending maybe on a service contract or something um, on, on, on service from, from one manufacturer. This is actually the basis for the circ economy which is offering new business models which are yet to come. Now, my last slide pretty much is um, that I wanted to to tell you about how powerful um, standardization actually is. The, and standards are accepted and applied worldwide. You know, on the ISO level, we have 164 members, and on European level, we have 34 members. And um, yeah, um, this is a pretty powerful tool. Just imagine if you take over a European standard in Europe, uh, publish one on Europe, on European level, then you replace 34 national standards. So that is pretty important. And plus, 
What is also important is customer acceptance. And you create that by complying to a standard. So standards build trust. Very, very important for the circ economy. So please get involved with us. If you have any ideas, we'd like to listen to that and um, come up with a solution together with you. And that's why my last slide, uh, how I want to conclude. Um, we want to be part of the solution, and that's why we're here. So thank you very much for listening, and um, I think we now continue with our next presentation. Great, uh, thank you, Benjamin. Until the presentation is being set up, I actually would like to know who has already bought a Cradle to Cradle certified product, or who has one at home. Great, I see a few hands, actually almost uh, half of the room, that's really, really encouraging. And um, you probably wonder, you know, who's the organization behind that who actually sets the standard for a Cradle to Cradle certified product and also gives then the label and the certification on that. And that's uh, the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, where I'm from. I'm the VP for strategy um, and, uh, and development, and it's really a pleasure uh, to be here today and you know, to join in this uh, wonderful uh, debate about cradle-to-cradle -cradle principles and the opportunities uh, they, they bring. I think we all know about um, the, urgent, uh, the urgencies uh, of our time, and we have heard a lot uh, about it uh, today already. You know, we know the growing population. We know the increasing uh, waste that is uh, very often uh, generated with the linear model uh, that is uh, to the majority still used. And then, of course, climate change, change very much in the spotlight at the moment in the, in the public uh, debate. And to tackle really those uh, emergencies and crises of our time, a bold vision is required. And we have really set this very bold vision at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute that uh, we aspire for a prosperous economy where safe materials are intelligently cycled and manufactured in ways that positively impact planet and uh, the people. The institute uh, was uh, set up about uh, 10 years ago. Okay, sorry. I think I need some... Sorry about the interruption, but I think I need some technical support because it's moving on my um, screen here and not on the overall screen. Maybe we can put it on uh, presentation mode. Yes, it will help. Uh, so the Institute uh, was uh, set up uh, 10 years ago in uh, 2010 by uh, Michael Braungart and uh, William McDonough. Meanwhile, we are an independent global non-profit organization with offices uh, in Amsterdam here in Europe and an office also in San Francisco in the U.S., and of course working with a broad variety of partners across uh, the world. And we are the standard setting um, organization and the certification body behind the Cradle to Cradle certified uh, product standard. At the heart uh, of our standard lies really the principles and all the concepts of Cradle to Cradle, namely to rethink the way how products are designed and how they are being made. And uh, what's really important, you know, nowadays uh, circularity is a big uh, discussion word. There are many initiatives going on, but we start in the Cradle to Cradle um, certified really with the, with the aspect of safe. So that the materials that you circle in loops, they don't have uh, any uh, negative impact and that they don't bring in harmful input, inputs when you, um, put, uh, when, you, when you actually apply the circular economy and have these endless uh, loops we are all uh, aspiring for. A circular is a very important uh, aspect as well, and then, of course, responsible. And those three elements, safe, circular, responsible, are reflected uh, in the standard. That is a global standard and is being set in a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, it is uh, really the leading standard. It is science-based. It's a product standard, and it's there for really helping to design and manufacture products uh, for, for tomorrow. It's also a standard that is supported by a verified assessment and then a certification which allows uh, the claim you would, for example, see on a product uh, that you buy in the stores that is uh, cradle-to-cradle certified. 
let's have a brief look uh, on the five categories of uh, the standard. It's a, a multi-category standard that can be applied across a variety of industries. So most of the products you find uh, nowadays on, that are cradle to cradle certified uh, either from the built environment um, area, and we will discuss this a little bit later also in the panel, or they are from textile apparel, uh, beauty care, cosmetic products, or also a packaging. The first area of the standard the category is material health. That looks really at the chemicals and the materials that are being used uh, in the product to assess them and to optimize them so that they are really safe for human health, for the environment, and also for future use and cycling. The second category is product circularity. This product circularity category looks at circular sourcing, uh, circular design, and circular systems so that the products are intentionally designed for their next use and for an active uh, cycling process. The third area, very much of course uh, at the moment also in the spotlight, is uh, renewable energy and climate, so that the product manufacturing results in a positive impact on the renewable energy supply and the balance um, of uh, climate changing greenhouse gases. The fourth area is uh, water stewardship, uh, that water is treated as a precious and as a shared uh, resource and that the watersheds are protected and clean water is available uh, to the people and uh, to all uh, the communities. And the fifth category, the last one of the standard, is social uh, fairness, so that manufacturers of a product are committed to human rights and applying responsible business uh, practices. These. Um, these five categories are all a part of the standard, underlined, of course, by criteria. And one of the principles of a Cradle to Cradle Certified is really to offer a pathway for continuous improvement of a product. Uh, and this is reflected how the standard is also set up. So we have a standard um, starting at the basic level, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Whereas platinum is the highest achievement uh, in, the, in the standard, where, of course, everybody is uh, actually also striving to. We have uh, most of the certified products at the moment are in the bronze, uh, silver, gold um, area, but we will actually, um, today, there will be a presentation later on where you will hear about an achievement that is uh, related to the platinum level of our, of our standard and our certification. Um, how does this look like in practice? Uh, we will discuss it on the panel, but uh, I would like to, to show three examples, uh, built environment and textiles. So built environment, uh, here we have examples from Drolltect. Drolltect uh, is uh, producing acoustic panels that are cradle to cradle certified on different uh, levels. And they are, for example, used in different buildings here in Germany. So the first one here you see here is the uh, Alnatura Arbeitswelt. They also received uh, the German Sustainability um, Award in uh, 2019, where these acoustic panels are used, or examples of two schools in Germany where those uh, acoustic panels are also being applied. And the second example is uh, from the textile and the apparel uh, industry, um, not necessarily fashion uh, related here, but more workwear related, very specific workwear. We will later also discuss a little bit. Uh, we have here examples from companies in Germany and in the Netherlands, I think two countries where, where workwear is, uh, is very much um, being uh, produced um, at different levels from Karl Dikhoff, you see her, from Inogema and from Van Bayernbrook textile in the, in the Netherlands. Um, we think uh, that, um, of course, you know, to achieve this pathway for improvement also in the standard, you know, to increase the level of sustainability, of circularity, innovation is very important. That's also one element our standard is driving very strongly. You know, companies are ambitious to start at one level and then to increase over time. Um, so we believe that really innovation and the collaboration that very often is required to achieve this innovation, either within a company or also within a supply chain, are really key uh, for addressing the urgencies of our time. And the uh, standard frameworks uh, have the power, like we see in the cradle to cradle certified world, that uh, they can accelerate um, the kind of delivery and the kind of action and are also a harmonized uh, means of measuring the progress uh, that is uh, being made uh, nowadays on the, on the products and on these uh, urgent, urgent topics. 
So, and of course, for achieving that, a community like this is uh, very important. People, you know, that raise the awareness, you know, that buy the products, that really uh, do these conscious purchasing decisions, and uh, looking forward uh, to further discussion and uh, to collaboration. Thank you very much. Now I invite all the participants of the panel discussion on the stage. So we have for our panel discussion a few more people than just for the talks because we want to represent not only the standardization part of the whole thing, but also the product part. And that's why I want to start with you, Tina. You represent Trolltech in our group now today. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we saw the example of Trolltech already in your representation, Christina, um, with the um, acoustic panels. And when I scrolled through your web page, I also saw that they can be painted like paintings, so I can have them in my room like really as art just acoustic art. Now, in your webpage, I saw quite an impressive amount of certificates. Why did you go to C2C as well? What was the driver behind going to that direction as well? Well, we started the certification process for Cradle to Cradle uh, almost 10 years ago. And we were at a point where we sort of just looked for an international environmental stamp to sort of verify our own our own sort of sustainability story. So it was merely just a environmental stamp that we were looking for, and that was our intention when we started the process. Um, but working with, with Cradle to Cradle, and during that process, we very soon realized that we cannot be Cradle to Cradle certified if we don't have a strategic approach to Cradle to Cradle. So we eventually decided to base our business strategy on the Cradle to Cradle principles along with having our product certified, and that's how we've been working since. But, of course, we have other certifications because uh, and at some markets you just can't enter the market without having different certification. But the, our strategic framework is Cradle to Cradle. And was the Cradle to Cradle idea not included in any of the other certificates? Um, parts, parts, yes, but not all of them. Okay. It's not as holistic as the Cradle to Cradle. Okay. So, coming back to Cradle to Cradle, Christina, when you think of the companies that come to you, what are the drivers or other drivers for companies to actually contact you and tell you, well, we want to go the Cradle to Cradle way, what do we have to do? Yeah, I, I think there are different motivations uh, for companies to get involved in, in Cradle to Cradle certified, and we also see or observe that those um, do those motivations change uh, over over time? So I would say at, at the more earlier stages of the standard, um, we saw that many companies came that were really already intrinsically motivated, intrinsically convinced by the framework. They just loved uh, the concept, they loved the idea on cradle to cradle, the <laughs> principles, and there was really a very strong intrinsic motivation um, to, to start on that, on that journey. I think uh, in recent years, one of the very big uh, motivating drivers we see is, of course, innovation. Um, as I said, the framework drives innovation, in particular at higher levels uh, of the standard. And many companies use this either to do a collaborative innovation in the supply chain, which is very often um, required, but of course also to differentiate themselves on the market, you know, with a, with a product that might be certified on a higher level. So I believe innovation is a big, uh, a big driver. The other one is that the framework is a very practical tool and a very holistic tool to achieve, for example, many of the sustainable development goals, or also some of the circularity goals that have been set by the company. So it's something that can be easily applied to achieve also sustainability strategies or business goals. Um, and I think the last point maybe to make, it is uh, a global standard. Uh, many companies like uh, the comparability, you know, you could have across uh, different markets and of course a certain recognition also by, uh, by the customers on a, on a global scale. Do they all come by themselves or do you have to like catch them by lasso? Well, I wish they would all come <laughs> by themselves. I hope with that here we can generate even more momentum. You know, we need more, you know, uh, more community uh, like like that, so that uh, it comes uh, comes more and more. Um, but I would say yes. Uh, over over the recent years, uh, this 
as this becomes uh, more, you know, common common knowledge, more in the awareness, also more companies is common, coming. But at the moment, it's really a two-way two-way approach: educating, informing, showing the opportunities, and some that, in particular, the pioneers or the leaders that uh, directly uh, come to us. So when you when you think of the companies that already work with you, how many of them are like certificate certified as a company, and how many have just one product? So our standard is a product certification. So we do not do any uh, overall company certification, but I think your question is uh, how, if there's a company where all the product lines uh, are basically cradle to cradle certified. Um, I believe we don't have this yet. Oh, uh, yes but you do. You? Okay. <laughs> okay, so then, uh, then you have the answer here. But, and we see more and more companies really moving in that, uh, in that direction, that really all uh, the product lines are certified. Okay, thank you. Now, in your talk, you spoke a lot of safety. And we have Mr. Hagerberling, your way of safety is a totally different approach of safety. You're working in the firefighting business. You're um, head of Section 8 of Personal Protective Equipment for Fire Brigades here in Germany. And you're also chair of the Standards Committee for Firefighting and Fire Protection. So you usually protect the person using whatever you create to be protected from fire or whatever. Now you, we are here at Cradle to Cradle. In our way, protection is more like protecting the environment and protecting the planet. Now, offensive question, why are you here? <coughs> I'm, I'm the align on the stage <laughs> because I'm expert on a very specific uh, uh, area. Uh, but I'm, I'm now on this stage because in the former times, I'm, I'm working for more than 30 years in the standardization of uh, firefighters' uh, personal protection equipment. We focused most of the years only on the product and the requirements to protect the user. We, ha we, we have not any view on the end of the circle. What happens, and I uh, give you these questions in the auditorium, what happens with all these uh, personal protective items when they should be replaced. Uh, when you take into account, we have in Germany more than one million male and female firefighters. They use, since I think uh, 15 years, 20 years, they use plastic helmets. These plastic helmets must be replaced after 10 years due to the act of uh, aging as, uh, when the uh, um, when the life age has uh, spun out and, and uh, the uh, manufacturer said you have to replace it. What happened with that? So, and, and I had an uh, event this morning. I was at the Dean Institute and uh, we talked about uh, a specific item for PPE for firefighters. And beside us in the room, there was a group. Uh, they are talking about the recycling of different plastics. I said, I, I don't know these guys. Why didn't we have, uh, in the past, an interchange between our uh, experiences? And so, it may be that for in the future we can look which kind of plastic materials we take for the helmets because we have a good choice for the recycling at the end of the use. And this is the reason why I'm here. So you're the bridge between theory, philosophy and the reality. Thank you for being here. Now, Martina, you also are doing a lot of standardization work. You've been doing a lot of um, standardization work on national, European, and international level since 2008 in the field of environmental uh, management systems. And now you're uh, the chairwoman of the new working group, Circular Economy, which was founded last year. Why is that? Isn't Circular Economy included in, in environmental management systems? Yeah, we thought that. So if you ask the um, uh, environmental standardization people, we, we were about to include circularity assessments in that, but then a new standard committee was created. And then um, all the community around the 14,001 standards were thinking, okay, we have to become active now that we are not creating a parallel world there and have to ensure full integration, connectivity, and collaboration from the 
um, circular economy thinkers that are coming into the field um, with the environmental managers, with the um, eco-product designers, because there has been done a lot, and it's not needed to reinvent everything. It, the challenge now is to connect and to build on each other's experiences. So you are kind of doing what you are missing because you are right from the start. You are trying to talk to each other, and you need somebody who makes yeah, people. Talk to you and talk to you. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> now, Benjamin, you represent Dean here, and you are head of the business development circular economy. Mm -hmm. Now, when when I started working for right. Dean, I learned that Dean is neutral. We are, have no influence in the content whatsoever. So how come? Dean now sets up this focus with circular economy and has you as a full-time person doing this. Yes, um, um, I can assure you that we're not losing our neutrality principles. But part of the job, of course, is putting out more feelers and uh, getting in touch with the players of the circular economy. And um, thinking about, and I, I think you, you shown that on one of the earlier slides, that we have 34,000 experts at Dean. And we organized that in 3,000 committees, uh, which is pretty powerful. But when you think about the circular economy, we, we are in a transition from linear to circular. And this is such a big change. And a lot of our stakeholders, um, they're in the middle of a transition. But they're, and also, we have also um, um, companies on board who are, who are living the circularity principles. But there's much more out there. And there may be some pioneers, some hidden champions of the circular economy, and that's part of the job, to get in touch with them and tell them how powerful standardization is. And um, that is, yeah, um, that is pretty much, uh, that is a fair bit of what I do. And yeah, I can assure you, we're not losing our maturity principles. Okay. Thank you, and now we want to get in touch with you. Do you have questions for one of us or all of us? Please feel free, language doesn't matter, as long as it's one that I speak and can translate. Include Spanish. Do we have a mic downstairs? Is there a mic downstairs? No. If not, we can give one downstairs. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions that are quite linked together. Um, standards are quite expensive, perhaps, to prepare, and certifications too for products. Uh, what are you perhaps already doing to get people who are, since a long time, as pioneers, as you say, doing this, but struggling and struggling since 20 years for some, uh, and not having uh, the financial possibility to pay for certification or to come to the committees regularly to make sure the DIN is in their interest? I get started then. I think um, it's pretty important that we, especially um, the small and medium-sized companies or even the startups, that they find that find their way to us and to do the standards. And of course, it's a, sometimes it's a, um, a short way to publish a standard, but um, I think in an average we have now, it takes no two years, so it takes some time. And, um, um, and also resources um, to, um, to be in the process involved. Um, First of all, what we do, we, um, um, we have a program um, at the moment, which is called Vipiano. And um, this problem is uh, covering a lot of expenses uh, to come to the um, standardization meetings. And, so, and also for startups, of course, um, uh, for very small uh, companies as well, we have like a very low entrance fee um, to uh, join the committees. Um, and I think that helps. Um, so if you know somebody uh, who is struggling to, to get on board, um, just get in touch with me. We've I think there, there are ways, um, and we find something. You wanted to continue? I can do. Yes, uh, I can comment that. I mean, you know, in order for a standard to be credible and globally applicable, it needs to be done in a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, so that's really best practices also by ISO. So that's an investment, of course, you know, people are making. We have our certification holders who are part of that, you know, who see also, you know, why this is important to, to provide the expertise there. 
and of course different experts and also, also independent uh, organizations. So that's really a role also we have of an institute to prepare a, a standard uh, like that in the most you know, rigorous and, and transparent and incredible, credible way, uh, because otherwise it will not help uh, later in the, in the industry and most uh, science-based. Uh, in terms of the implementation of uh, the standard and then of course the certification that uh, stands at uh, the end of it. Um, yes, it, it very much uh, depends of course where the companies stand, you know, where they start, you know, if they have already certain systems in place, if they may work already with other, other standards. So let's say our approach to that in this uh, Cradle to Cradle Certified is that we try of course to recognize as many other um, initiatives that are already there and tie them together also in the in the standard framework. So to really that, you know, the wheel is not reinvented, but that, you know, whatever companies might do can feed into the framework and feed uh, towards, the, towards the certification. Um, often, you know, in particular, if innovation is involved, there is some initial investment that's uh, being done uh, done by the company, which might only you know pay uh, off uh, at, the, at the later later stage. And how we are also trying to support the uptake is um, to share really the experiences of our certification holders as much as possible to show the best case practices to discuss you know challenges, how hurdles have been overcome, so that we can really motivate and inform the implementation on the on the company level. When I want to put this very short. Yes, it is expensive, that is true. And if you do not have the money because you are a startup or something, there are programs. Do you want to say something? Uh, I think uh, in your initial um, presentation, there was the open source hardware um, standard mentioned. And this standard is also open source available. And so okay. also this, uh, because standards are expensive in making them, and sometimes you could also consider it a hurdle that you have to buy them also, which is not the case for the product standard. That's an open source standard. You can just download it. But for many of the Dean standards, there is, it's part of the financing. Um, but there is ways of getting there um, also for a bigger company to become a Dean member and to spread it internally. So if you look at only one user, it looks maybe expensive. But if you um, then look at that, that is really changing how you operate, um, then you can make a business case from that as well, as, as of our experience from the standard work of the last years. Yeah, um, just one, um, one addition is um, what I forget, forgot to mention is that um, draft standards are available on our uh, standards portal. So all the draft standards, you can uh, access them freely and um, yeah, without being charged. Uh, plus, um, our entire terminology is, is open. Um, yeah. So, do we have another question? One here and then. Oops. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm I'm very much into uh, change and transformation. I work as a as a consultant and coach for that. Um, uh, the the headline is very promising. You know, set standard, close uh, cycles. But for me, as an, uh, a change expert, you know, uh, standardization and transformation is a contradiction in itself. Again? Is a contradiction in itself. Um, if, if you heard the auditorium, the, the panels, uh, you know, uh, it's a lot of, about greenwashing still going on. And, you know, I, I actually know a lot of companies that do uh, sort of contribute to SDGs, you know, and it's a very easy way to do that. And you have the impression, oh, I'm doing a lot and I'm changing and recycling and all that stuff. So this is a very much open question that I want to put into the panel, how you, you think about that. Uh, from my views, uh, you know, in transformation, you have to do sort of trial and, uh, trial and error, do prototyping, and sort of standards can be contradicting to that, you know, can really sort of, uh, yeah, avoid the change that is necessary to do. I want to give this question to you, Tina, because you are the cradle-to-cradle -cradle company and this is definitely a standard. Thank you. Well, I actually don't agree because we really entered the cradle-to-cradle -cradle scheme to avoid greenwashing um, because cradle-to-cradle -cradle is very credible and it sort of verifies what we do. And you have to look, you have to differentiate between the products that are already in the market, in the existing buildings. We have to find safe ways to recycle those products, but when, but when you look ahead with new products, a standard is very essential because we have to ensure that we only introduce safe products. 
And that's one of the very, very big strengths with Cradle to Cradle, because we don't know just what's not in the products, like many other standards, having a list with these uh, dangerous substances are not in our products. With Cradle to Cradle, you actually know what's in your products, down to 100 ppm. And that's the strength of the standard. It actually also addresses one of the other questions, because that's also one of the reasons why a standard is cost, it costs some resources and, and money. Because I, we have a relatively simple product, <coughs> but we have some sub-suppliers. And we also need to know what's in the recipes of our sub-suppliers. But of course, they will not inform us about that as a competitive advantage for them. But we have these um, non-disclosure agreements between our cradle to cradle assessor and our sub-suppliers. So our assessors know what's in the product. And that's the strength of it. And I want to give this question also to you, Mr. Hageberling, because you just talked about trying to change something that has been done like in a certain way forever, and now you want to change this. And you're using standardization to do that. Why do you use standardization to have the change? Now, this is, uh, I think, a practical way to, to find a solution for that. What have we done in the past? We looked on the product, we, we looked on the user, we looked on, on the uh, environment, uh, in which the user has to work, and then uh, our thinking stops. So we must open our mind and look what is at the end of the circle. And uh, so uh, when, when, when we talked about some materials, we look on the characteristics of these materials, uh, um, how can these materials fulfill the requirements, technical requirements. We do not look on the materials, what happens at the end of the circle, and I think this is a good approach uh, that we can solve the problems, and so uh, maybe we, we have some examples how it works when you look at uh, reach and rows and, and what is going on to the, the uh, recycling of batteries or something else. It works if the system is, uh, uh, involves all the, the, the person, the population, and I think uh, there's also in the standardization a way to do this. Thank you very much. There are more questions in the middle. Can we have the microphone there, please? Um, I, I, I don't agree as much uh, with the previous uh, question that uh, there is a contradiction between standards and transformation. Um, I think standards are necessary uh, to drive transformation. So we are working, for example, to establish a new system of reusable packaging for uh, product segments other than water and beer, right? In Germany, we have this MEVEX system for water and beer, and we would like to establish a similar system uh, for other product categories. And one of the gaps that we identified is are indeed standards. Um, my question is, you know, there is now a lot of innovation happening, and I, try, I would like to build up on the previous question. There is a lot of innovation. There are lots of prototypes, and there are lots of experiments, such as Loop, that many of you will know, and Bananera, et cetera. How do you go about uh, setting, you know, an international standard without killing that innovation? When, you know, when is it too early, when is it too late, and uh, you know, in how far can a standard, in, in how far does a standard uh, only look at what is out there already, or can maybe also look ahead, what needs to happen in order for the loop to get closed? I think this question goes to you guys, and first to you, because that's what you're doing right now at the TC Circular Economy, isn't it? Yeah, I think the biggest um, opportunity is to um, do standards in a way that they are kind of separate, in a framework standard that is mainly about principles, about terminology, about understanding um, the overall goal, and about setting the rules how to assess things and how to measure things. So in, in this international standardization activity on circular economy, one working group is going to work on measuring and assessing circularity. Very broad, different levels, and the, the rules that are set, uh, or are going to be set, this is just starting, um, will be in a framework level to be applicable in general, and that then uh, also creates the challenge, okay, this is very, can be easily interpreted, and um, everyone can think of um, how I want to understand that, so it cannot stop with that. But that is the foundation. And then you need to become very specific. And for the specific ones, for that can be annexes, and that can be technical reports, um, you need a, a quicker innovation cycle. 
um, and technical reports can be updated within a year. So it's not like um, always that you need two or three years. And so you need to have, to, you need to see what will remain and what needs to change. And in principle, the standard world is ready for that. It's maybe not that everybody is using it accordingly. And the question why is very often related to interested parties. And you need to make these interests that are at the table very visible um, to be able to address them and say, look, we understand that for your industry, metal, plastics, whatever, you might get some tough new requirements in the future to become circular, but you are not alone. It's for the whole industry. So find a way to do it together, collaborate on that, and not block it. It's easier said than done. Thank you. There were first, there were two questions and then there, I don't really see your faces. I'm sorry if I can't pick the right person. Thank you a lot. I'm coming from the industry and I have a question about the C2C, uh, C2C standard. Um, we use a lot of standards in the industry and uh, it changes sometimes, uh, but not, all, not so often. And uh, sometimes it's more detail or adjustment. But for cradle to cradle, we are at the fourth version already in 10 years. So it changed a lot. And uh, developing product, developing industry based on the standard that change every two years, in average, uh, it's not so easy. So can you comment? Can you explain a little bit? Yes, so you're right. Uh, this year, we are actually bringing out uh, the version 4 of the standard. Um, and uh, I think the last standard update is uh, three, four years back, four years, five years back. So it has been quite a while. There have been some versions at the, at the beginning. But let's say the 3.1 that's currently being used in the market has been around for you know, four, four or five years, I believe. Um, the adjustments um, we felt were necessary. You know, also as science you know, evolves, as there are further developments uh, in the market, as the market also transforms you know, and is on a higher level already uh, around, uh, let's say, um, chemical management topics or also circularity topics. Um, and we also, for example, in the current version or the new one that will come out, we have uh, taken a very close look uh, at, uh, let's say, social topics and enhanced this a little bit more. So there, we are. So there were some adjustments necessary, let's say, overall on the ambition level that we felt is already uh, you know, um, suitable for the time uh, we are in, and then also, of course, findings uh, that, that occur and, and best practices that arise in technological um, uh, changes uh, or you know, transformation um, throughout the years. Um, it is not our intention you know, to uh, come up with a, a new standard uh, every, every two years, and again, if you look at it, uh, the, main, the main changes have been on the social fairness and on the product circularity uh, category. Um, but uh, we will, of course, you know, keep this as a kind of living document, and I think there is, of course, the opportunity in that, you know, to really reflect the times, to reflect uh, the best practices in the market, and to not, you know, hinder innovation in that in that sense uh, sense as well. Um, so that's all I can say at this stage. The version four will will be published uh, this year, and of course, there's a transition period also, you know, when we switch from one version to the other. So there's a transition period for the industry to adapt uh, to potentially new new requirements. Thank you. There was a question. I would have a question towards uh, the communication of the certification. So as I understood it, there's the basic and then it goes up to platinum. But uh, I presume that the consumer is not really looking at the small written basic or platinum. They only look at the cradle to cradle. And I was, yeah, my question would be, how do you communicate with the companies that a basic Cradle to cradle certification has also further challenges. And how do you make sure that in that term no greenwashing comes comes into place? Okay, that was, uh, that was to me. Okay, great. Um, 
Yes, uh, you're right. So the cradle to cradle uh, certified mark, it can be used, you know, on, on the product as such. Uh, it can be used, you know, on the hand tags. Sometimes actually it's not even used on the consumer product. Sometimes it's just used in the social or social media on the web pages. It depends a little bit really on the communication strategy of the, of the company. But um, let's say where it's being used, let's say on hand tags or also sometimes on the packaging, there's usually um, a story, you know, that, that comes with that, you know, that the company tells. You know, in particular, social media is quite effective uh, these days. Many are switching in this direction. In particular, when we speak about consumer-facing products, I think for built environments, there are different communication approaches, and it's a little bit more business uh, to business. Um, it, is, uh, it is right. Um, that maybe for the consumer on the product, I mean, it's of course the different colors we have, and you know, you can you can uh, give the give the level there, but it's maybe um, you know they would have to go back, you know, and also look a little bit uh, maybe at the web page to learn more information. It's just a quick indication uh, indication for them on the on the product, but usually the storytelling that we do as an institute or that the companies do, they really help to to explain then more the details. And on our web page, we also have something like a product directory where these products are in. And then uh, there's also some informational products and our intention actually at the Institute to really help also the consumer awareness is to evolve this product directory that it can target different audiences because at the moment it's a little bit more for, for companies I would say, you know, for people that are really in the industry, but definitely also from our side we need to see that it gets a little bit uh, stronger from the Institute side also on the, on the consumer facing uh, communication. So there will definitely further steps be taken to raise really the awareness also on the on the different levels on the on the end consumer and i want to give the greenwashing part of the question to you tina because <laughs> you being a company that has been certified cradle to cradle you can tell us do they really make sure there is no greenwashing going on <laughs> i think i have to to add a comment to the different levels of cradle to cradle because it's a very dynamic certification as a certification holder you are you have to improve on all five levels, uh, from material health to social, um, to, to CSR. Um, you're recertified every second year, and you have to document your improvements. You cannot just have a basic or bronze level certification and just stop there. You have to improve all the time. Um, we currently only have one certif certificate that covers uh, all our uh, cement-bonded wood, wood products the painted and the unpainted. We could have achieved gold level with the unpainted panels actually a long time ago, but we chose uh, to keep working with our suppliers in order to improve and to find a new recipe so that we could sort of advance to gold level with the whole product range. But I think it's, it's in the recertification, it's in the assessment that, that it's actually secured that you, you cannot just do nothing. More questions? There's always more hands going up. You have to have the little bit overview because I don't see the faces. Hello and thanks for the con commitment for the panel. Really appreciate it. I want to set um, cradle to cradle in context of software. Um, taking over the perspective of a producer, I, I'm a little bit skeptical because um, even if a producer would like to transition to a closed loop business model, there might be um, huge hurdles. So my question to you is, do you see um, potential for software to support that process? Do you see that already software exists that is able to track material um, over the different stages of the life cycle? Well, this is your question because you work for a software company. Yeah. Um, so iPoint is an IT company and our aim is enabling digital circular economy and materials traceability and supply chain traceability down to the substance level is possible. It's not always required. And we, ha we have in the compliance field, um, so where you have to do things, this C2C is still a voluntary standard, so you're not obliged to do it. But if someone says, I cannot do it because it's not possible, technically, it's an excuse. Um, in the compliance context, we also see a development to full substance disclosure, so we expect that to be mandatory in the coming years. It's very difficult to really predict the month and the year, but e wherever you look, everyone gets prepared for. 
to do that. And I want to address um, the difference between transparency and traceability, which is a bit in the, in the context of what you mentioned. So you have transparency for certain stakeholders, and you ensure full traceability for all to protect the IP. And we work in the blo with blockchain to secure that because we see that is the solution to create the trust into that data that is shared there across communities and across supply chains. I want to uh, change the question a little bit and give it to you, Christina, because it's actually a question I have myself. You say it's cradle to cradle. It's not cradle to cradle for food or cradle to cradle for textiles. So you tell me that it's cradle to cradle for just everybody. So how do you approach somebody whose um, business model is totally new to you? So, so yeah, it's right. Uh, the standard how it's set, it's applicable across sectors, right? Um, so that is uh, intentionally how it is uh, how it is being set, uh, and of course in the way how it's implemented, you know, in the guidance how it's being implemented, there are differentiations, of course, you know, to take into account uh, the different uh, sometimes sector specifics uh, that we have. But the overall framework, the global one, is is uh, is across the, the sectors. Uh, you were asking about uh, business models. Or so um, when I come to you and I have yeah. a product you never certified oh, yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, but this is this happens all the time, and we like that actually. So we would like to have more products we have not uh, not certified uh, before. So basically, what the companies do, they work with our accredited assessors. We have a whole pool of accredited assessors who are really experts uh, on the different uh, products or different supply chains. And the framework actually is really the guidance um, how to assess also new products. It can be for you know products that are completely new in the market or some that are in the market and are already improving. So I think that's really the beauty of it. So it's not, a, not an issue at all. It only gets interesting if it's something you know, that was never, never assessed uh, so far. I think our assessors also like that. I, I have a question. Um, would it be possible, because you said you have a product standard, and, uh, and they're like um, on ISO level and SEN level, um, there are like 30,000 30, standards available. So if there's something which is not yet uh, covered by the product standard. Do you look into other standards where you could actually refer to something w and find something which gives a good baseline? Yeah, we do this. And this is, of course, a very sector-specific question also. So just to say, let's say, in the built environment, you know, we are not a building standard. We are um, building material product standard. So there, for example, we link very closely with with um, standard programs that certify, let's say, buildings as such. So there are linkages made. Or in the textile space, uh, if there are certain uh, standards out there, you know, on particular aspects, be it on chemicals management or on organic fibers, so that's, of course, also recognized in the standard. So yes, we try to make the linkages as much possible, align as much possible, and realize synergies. Yeah. We have a question more here. Well, we have many more questions. <laughs> Yes, um, yes, thank you very much. Um, well, actually, I have two questions. Um, first is, um, I studied uh, once upon a time uh, wood science and technology, and in the wood business, it, it's like that, that there are two main standards, is the PFC and the FSC standard. And yeah, usually you cannot buy any wood, or you cannot sell any wood in Europe because nobody will buy it um, without this standard. And do you, this is the first question, do you see that the cradle to cradle can be such a standard that more and more products cannot be sold anymore without this standard? And yeah, and if so, um, do you think that there will be a more and more business model for consultants that, uh, yeah, it gives uh, a hint to companies to achieve to get uh, the standard. So do you think that maybe this would be also a new job market? <laughs> well, definitely. <laughs> I want to give this question to Tina because you are selling a cradle-to-cradle -cradle product in a market where there's definitely not cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified uh, products. Do you feel that the demand for your product is rising or do you think, well, it was just expensive and it was our hard blood, but it doesn't really show? 
No, I I really think it has been worth the while because it has given our sustainability story a credibility that we could have not achieved uh, with certification that hasn't been that uh, holistic as the cradle to cradle. But I totally agree there are a lot of certifications and it is uh, we're a medium sized company and it can be quite a jungle and it can be very expensive. And for anyone who has the answer, what would we have to do in order to get exactly that? That we need the CTC certificate because nobody will buy a product if it doesn't have it. Um, yeah, what, what could help? Um, I think the C2C standard is a fantastic uh, piece of work and it, it helps the industry a lot. Um, but where we could actually help us, uh, we have um, ISO standards in place and European standards in place and they're widely used. So the good work which is done at the PII, um, if that could also find its way into the international standardization systems, um, just to, to spread um, the message and, and to input which is a new standard. So um, this could help to, to place standards on the market which are widely used and then are also accepted and which will also then finally promote the C2C <coughs> approach, I suppose. Now, I want to ask Mr. Hageberling, now you're working with Dean, you're not working with PII. You didn't come to the cradle to cradle people in order to get the things done you want to get done, but you're working with Dean. What made you do that? Do you like see advantages of working with Dean, or which we don't see? At first I have to point out uh, a Dean standard or any standard is not a Bible. So we got to, we got to some uh, approaches from the auditorium. So everybody uh, has the right to comment on standards. So every standard has to uh, uh, be revised every five years. And we, uh, as uh, dean uh, experts, we control the contents and we control also the actual actuality of this standard. And then we decide we get rid of it or we revise it in a modern way. So in the past, the different standards changed. At first, the, the standardization was focused, um, design orientated. The next step was that we look on the standards and say, oh, design orientated is too restrictive. We are going to uh, look at the system, the system for use, and then we try to uh, create a standard around this. And the next step is that we look in the uh, complete, we look on the complete circle um, of use, and then we have to look on the last stages of that. And so I will ask you, when we talk about, for example, the textiles, and the textiles will be dirty and have been washed. Has anybody looked what happens with the wastewater? And when I take this uh, uh, example from, from my working area, then it is quite clear that when firefighters are coming back from the fire ground, they are contaminated with some not healthy uh, substances. And nobody has any idea what happened with the wastewater when they put all these textiles in the washing machine. And this is one aspect that we have to look uh, that an, an uh, standard will not end at the product. It must end in the process. That's the new approach. Thank you. Do you have one more? Yeah, how can it be mainstream? Basically, that is what your question is. And I think we, if we look back um, and the involvement of the standard ISO 9, 9001, which is a quality management system. And that was at some point in history also new. And people were asking, do I really need quality management? If you today go to industry, there is no questioning about quality management. Um, and so getting it mainstream, getting it into the standard systems that um, becoming part of a sustainable operating system in a, in a company, aspects that are coming from uh, C2C, from um, product lifecycle management, from um, lifecycle thinking, all this needs to become part of a sustainable operating system and mainstream. And this is starting points here, showing that it's working, showing that it's possible, and making others follow. And leading by example, I think, was one of the 
talks this, this morning, um, and leading by example is what everybody is obliged to do today. What you just mentioned is something I experienced too in my four years at working for Dean. As soon as things become part of a Dean standard, then suddenly the old thinking industry will take it into account. And as long as it is just somewhere, they think, wow, perfect, somebody who wants to pay more can do that, but I don't have to deal with it. So let's hope that happens. We have time for one more question. You've been trying to get the microphone off for so long. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm working in the textile service industry, and that, that is one part of my question. We are looking at a product standard when we look at cradle to cradle. The thing that we are missing is the service around the product, because the service is actually able, when the product is designed correctly, the service is able to use the product much more uh, if we have products that are able to be used more. So I work for the laundry industry, and they actually try to get products and to get standards for these products to get the, let's say, towels or, or, or uh, bed linen or whatever being used not only 10 times, not only 20 times, but 100 times, 150 times. But we need standards that actually work with the products and that make products uh, the, the life cycle of the products much longer, 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 longer. And that's what we will tr want to try through standards. So this is actually working for circular economy. And that was my question. Cradle to cradle is a product standard. Can, I mean, a product that can only be used once uh, could actually be a cradle to cradle product, although there are other products for the same use which can actually be used a hundred times. So would such a product actually get the certification of cradle to cradle knowing that it was produced only for one use and that we have, for example, textiles that can be used 150 times for the same use and for the same process? You need to add the next level, the sixth, like the service around the product. E exactly, and I just, that's a long discussion, of course, but just briefly comment in the version four, in the updated version that is coming out this year, significantly the product circularity category, you know, has been, let's say, revised, reviewed, exactly also to take uh, some of those aspects into account. So there's also a whole um, element around circular systems in there, which goes more into a service-oriented uh, model as well. So it, even though, you know, it's called a product standard, in the end, you know, it also look, if you look at the criteria, it also looks into processes. It looks also in particular services. It's just at the end, you have something you can put on a final product. I also want to ask Tina, because you have the product, you are the company, does this go into account, like you, you said in your um, videos on your webpage, it's like it can be replaced, it can be reused, so was this part of the certificate? Well, what, what, is, um, what is certified and what we are focusing on is at the end of the lifetime, because we are when a building, we're working with a building material that has a very long lifetime, um, way beyond 50 years, um, and it's not just about recycling because it's we have a lot of reuse. A lot of reuse is happening that we are not involved in, and that's a lot of people call reuse recycling, which is just confusing because you still have waste at the end of reusing. Um, perhaps it's just better and, and more environmental, better to have a product with a long life than that it's not have to be replaced every ten years. But that's another discussion. But what we're focusing on is that when the product can no longer be be reused it doesn't end up as waste, it is recycled. And that's really the essential part of, of the circular idea in, in Cradle to Cradle. So we have time for one more question, then the time is already over, but we are here the rest of the day. So just grab one of us and place your question after the talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering what's your stake on standardization and material passports, uh, where we are standing right now, and that's if that's even part of uh, your conversations ever at Dean or at iPont. Thank you. I think this goes to Martina. <laughs> yeah, I, I think material passports, especially in, uh, in building materials industry, become more and more popular. 
So I, I see that e even as part uh, of roadmaps. Um, um, but I also know in the uh, there is the international or the global battery alliance, the topic of electric vehicles, um, and they are discussing a, a battery passport. Because uh, if you want to make that somehow more sustainable, then getting these materials back in the best possible quality that are entering in batteries is totally crucial if you want to have something that is close to be a more sustainable mobility. Um, and there's a European Battery Alliance, which I hope that they are going to connect with the global one properly and not do something in parallel, but we help them to know of each other. <laughs> Tina, did you have to have a material passport for your panels? I'm actually in a working group uh, establishing material passports in the building industry in Denmark. Uh, it was suggested one or two years ago on a European level to have a common European material passport for building materials. Unfortunately, some of the big countries opposed, so it, wasn't, it was stopped. Uh, but there has been an initiative in Denmark led by your sister organization, the Danish Standardization Organization, and there will be launched a material passport this year based on European standards so that it can easily be converted to an European standard. So Mr. it is coming. Mr. Hagerberling, having a material passport would, in your field, also include that this material passport would have to add all the contaminations this um, jacket of the firefighter has seen over the years, so in order to know what to do with it at the end of the lifetime. Would this help your approach? Uh, if the user can uh, um, documentate all these uh, stress uh, um, aspects, then it may be uh, useful. But uh, it is very difficult to bring this in the area of the users. So the, the only thing w where we have an, uh, a periodically uh, a documentation is when using, for example, uh, respiratory uh, protective devices. Because it is a, a high level uh, p uh, personal protective uh, equipment and so there is a documentation all over the lifespan and also there are uh, some uh, uh, periods where you have to change some uh, of the parts uh, to keep the item safe. But uh, concerning the contamination, it is uh, only the process, uh, process of uh, cleaning and <coughs> the question we deal in the moment is how clean is clean? And uh, you're the expert for the laundry and I, I think you know the problem. How clean is clean and how can you uh, um, avoid any contamination which uh, goes out of the fire service to the private area? And that is a very, very big issue in the moment. Benjamin and Martina, are you working on... Uh, Christina, I'm sorry. <laughs> Too many Tinas on the stage. <laughs> is there a working in this area at your companies as well? Benjamin? Is, is Dean already working on like material passport? Is there already something going on like this? Or is this homework for us to go home and start it? Um, one example, what we have in place is uh, building information management systems. This is a very good example for uh, material passport um, because you can allocate exactly where the materials are built uh, and in which parts of the building. So um, this is something which we have and where, where we have good standards. Um, yeah, so um, there's something some we we are having. Yeah, cool. In the version four, in the um, in the product uh, circularity category, it will be included. We'll probably not call it material passport because there might be some some different um, yeah levels we require also on you know information in there. It might not be exactly the same, you know, like the current material passport out there, but it is included. The concept, yes. That's so perfect. Yeah. Sorry, um, because the material passport, it sounds a bit like it is something that you do in the beginning and then it's there and then it stays. Um, and for the use case you mentioned, and for many use cases, we need something that is more dynamic. And in technology, we talk about the so-called digital twin. And that is a and there we have some sensors um, related to it. And then this physical thing has its digital twin and that learns what is happening to it mm -hmm. and is recording all these lifetime experiences that thing um, that we are talking about um, is having 
And so I assume we will really see tremendous involvement in that technology um, that helps us to trace and to handle better um, end of life or use phase um, situations from a technology perspective. So let's all be part of making that happen. I hope you all understood that there's already a lot of things happening, but there could be more happening and you are the ones you can actually do something because for technical standardization, technical um, rule setting, you are the ones sitting on the table. You don't elect somebody who is there and who hopes to vote on the right, uh, voting for the right thing, but you can be sitting there and actually doing the discussions. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your patience.